members, by organizing continuous professional development program for its members and students. The presentation on the Inland Revenue Amendments Bill will be conducted by a panel of experts in taxation. The presentation on the Bill on Individual Taxation will be delivered by Mr. Atula Ranavira, Managing Partner Ranavira Associates, and on Company Taxation will be delivered by Mr. N. Sulaiman, Partner Tax Ernest and Jan. This will be followed with a brief presentation and a quick and a Q&A session with Mr. Suresh Pereira, Principal Tax and Regulatory at KPMG, Mr. K. Sivanes, and Tax Consultant and Senior Partner at Amrasagar and Company, Dr. D. Kuladunga Raja Baksha, Group Chairman D of DSI, and Mr. Mahendra J. Sir, Managing Director, Langa Tiles PLC, and Chairman CMASB, which will be moderated by Mr. Duminda Kulangamo, Head of Tax for Partner Ernest and Young, and Deputy Vice Chairman, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. I also warmly welcome CMA Founder President Professor Lakshman R. Vattavala, Vice President of CMA and President of SAFA, Mr. Henaka Bandara, other council members, members of CMA, invitees, ladies and gentlemen. To commence the program, I have the pleasure in inviting Professor Lakshman R. Vattavala, Founder President CMA Sri Lanka to deliver the welcome address and introduce today's topic. Professor Lakshman R. Vattavala has led the Sri Lankan accounting profession having been the president of the Chartered Accountants, president of South Asian Federation of Accountants, and founder signatory to the formation of SAFA, founder of WAT Sri Lanka and founder of CMS Sri Lanka. He is currently a SAFA board member and chairman of SAFA International Relations Committee. Professor Lakshman R. Vattavala, I am honored to invite you to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gajendra. I think... Uh... As the chairman of the taxation committee, you must be happy to note that uh, there were close upon 700 registrations, you know. So uh, we have found that uh, this is the most uh, popular, uh, maybe the theme uh, for any of our webinars. So I think you've already introduced everyone. We have our vice president and president of SAFA, Mr. Hinnayaka Bandara, all our speakers and the panelists and the moderator and all our valuable participants who have, uh, I know, assembled in large numbers to hear about the Inland Revenue Amendment Bill, uh, which is going to uh, affect everyone. So there are two people uh, who will be affected. Of course, the business people are uh, very much interested. Uh, then, of course, there are the individuals, of course, the professionals. Now, professionals... Uh, are a special category, but I know that professionals are being affected. Then this will also take into account the government revenue uh, to increase the government revenue. Why are they doing this? Uh, to increase the government revenue and of course, uh, uh, to reshape the economy. So everything is we are reshaping now. And uh, of course, you know that uh, we are uh, in uh, deep trouble in uh, uh, debt and of course uh, unable to pay the debts at the moment which is not a very good uh, sign uh, because especially from the private sector we think it is a very poor management that has taken place but one of the things is uh, now more, all these taxes will be on the society or the public uh, but I am only uh, worried that uh, there is no mention about uh, any reduction yeah. in the expenditure because how much uh, additional tax we pay today, again, it may have to be increased maybe in another uh, one month or two months if the expenditure is not curtailed. So government expenditure is a very important area that we need to consider because uh, from the private sector side, we know that uh, expenditure is a very important area and uh, not only salaries are cut, but also all... Uh, uh, traveling, uh, various expenditure in order to meet the income that we are getting. But uh, if we are getting a government revenue where we are increasing the taxes, we are unable to meet the uh, expenditure and we find that uh, the uh, we are still going into deficit, I don't think even the IMF is going to agree. So first of all, I think uh, we need to ensure that uh, we have to cut the expenditure because especially a lot of these monies are going to pay the salaries of the public servants, say 1.6 million. 
so i don't know whether the iim may, uh, may say that uh, you know you need to reduce to 500000 then of course there is a very big saving but what are they going to do uh, only thing that we can do is to uh, train and retrain them so that means uh, education has to come in a very big way skill development where uh, they can even become entrepreneurs they can go overseas and earn employment uh, so these are areas that one can uh, look into so today we have a very expert uh, panel of uh, tax consultants we have industrialists we have businessmen we have uh, uh, those uh, who are also from the professional side who will be able to explain to you about uh, uh, this uh, great changes that have taken place so if you really see i am sure that they will all explain to you that uh, the slabs have been reduced the uh, the tax you have to pay has gone up uh, on your interest income you have to pay withholding tax uh, companies uh, tax rates going up to 30 uh, percent uh, expenditure uh, especially the concessionary tax rates and uh, they are no longer there that means our productivity has to be improved we have to reduce government expenditure we have to uh, retrain our uh, uh, people who are working both in the public and the private sector we have to prevent waste and corruption but unfortunately today i'm uh, really surprised i really do have no answer for this every day the cost of items are going up i thought that it was initially due to the depreciation of the currency but that is now uh, quite stable at maybe 364 or maybe within that range but you find that uh, even especially in the medical sector, the health sector, the drugs, today it is one price, tomorrow is double, treble, all these prices. So I think uh, government needs to enroll strict uh, uh, cost control, price control. And we as certified management accountants, we will be able to help the government in this regard. Because if the government does not uh, take note of this, I think they are going to be in serious trouble because people are... Uh, going to pay all these high costs, then how how can this happen? There must be some valid reason as to how uh, one can pay. You see, we have, once it goes up, it's okay. But every day, you know, uh, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. So I don't think that we can accept this. So government needs to really do this, but that also to do, uh, they should, they need to have uh, maybe train people. Now, one of the things is that people have really found that uh, the government has been not been able to manage their affairs properly. Uh, what I would like to recommend is that we now have to go on a public-private partnership. That is, all government departments, ministries, we should also have private people uh, operating and that they will be able to help the government to come out of this situation. I can just give you one example because sometime back, uh, the finance ministry was looking at their projects. They found that the projects were uh, not running properly. They were getting delayed. Then they formed some expert committees. You know, the expert committees consist of senior uh, retired public servants, the finance people, uh, those who have headed corporations, those who have headed companies. So I was, I was also in one of those, you know, and we really found that this changed the whole atmosphere and we found that they were all then falling into line, their expenditure was controlled, their projects were going on time. And then, of course, uh, finance ministry, as you know, they have to provide the money. So always you find that if finance ministry is going to control, they will not be able to do it because they are the ultimate offender in most of these acts because they must find the money to give it for these projects. So that's why I think uh, today the word is public-private partnership. If without that, I don't think that uh, any people will take it seriously because they some of the people from the private sector will have the knowledge, uh, the senior public retired servants, they will have the knowledge to help the government in overcome these things. So those are a few remarks that I thought that I will make. So I'm thankful to our presenters of uh, the uh, tax proposals. Uh, maybe after we complete it, I'm sure that uh, we will be able to submit these proposals to the government in order that they can consider this. But one area is exports, because I can tell you, I was the chairman of the BOI in 1993. And uh, uh, you know this, uh, of course the World Bank was not in favor of that, but uh, we gave tax holidays. We, are, we set up the 200 garment factories program. We gave tax holidays 
I think uh, the exports at that time was maybe about 100 million, 150 million or 200 million US dollars. But maybe today it is 5 billion US dollars. So this, uh, this also helps the economy, employment, the export earnings, all these. So we, I think uh, all these have to be taken into account when we look at the export industry. Today, we have to double the exports. Then only we can repay all these loans. So if you increase uh, taxation, I don't think that uh, that will really maybe uh, incentivize our exporters in this regard. So that's uh, one key area I thought that we should look into. And certainly I do hope that the government will give uh, uh, a lower rate, uh, what was there earlier, at least 14% without going for 30%, which is uh, there must be a differentiation between the local industry and the export industry. Otherwise, we will not be able to get the foreign thing. So thank you very much. And I do hope that everyone will be able to gain quite a lot uh, from this. And also, please send your questions on Q&A so that the panel will uh, be able to answer them and take you in the right direction. Thank you and uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you, sir. Next on agenda is the presentation on the Inland Revenue Amendments Bill provision related to individual taxation by Mr. Atula Ranavira, Managing Partner, Ranavira Associates, an expert in the field of taxation. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in my presentation, I will cover the, in, uh, the amendments, what they have included into the bill with relate to the individuals, then certain amendments with relate to the withholding tax and a few amendment connecting with the tax administration. Now, to support my present um, uh, lecture, I will open a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I think you all can see this PowerPoint presentation. Yes, yes. Insights of latest income tax bill, the Inland Revenue Amendment Bill of 11th October 2022. Now I'll be, as I mentioned, I'll be covering the individuals, uh, amend, amendments with related to the individuals taxation, withholding tax and uh, tax administration, where, uh, where Mrs. Uh, Mr. Suleiman will cover the corporate sector amendments. Now, yeah, individuals. Now, first, in my slide, the first slide, I have, I have included the changes what they have proposed. Now, important changes with relate to individuals taxation with effect from the date uh, of uh, date of um, the, the effect from first of October 2022, but still this is a bill. Therefore, at the bottom, I have mentioned, please be noted that until legislation of this bill, this is not a legal document. Therefore, we need not to act according to these proposals until the bill is legalized. Right. Saying that, now what are the amendments with relate to individual taxation? One most important amendment is the reduction of personal allowance from 3 million to 1.2 million. At present, we get 3 million. They are proposing to reduce it up to 1.2 million. Then the slabs. At present, we have tax slabs of 3 million each. We have two tax slabs of 3 million each, 6%, 12%. Then they are after 18%. Now they are proposing to reduce these individual tax slabs up to 500,000 rupees. Right. Then they propose to reduce the tax rates as well, the, the, the restructure the uh, tax rates also. At present, we have 6%, 12%, 18%. They are proposing to change it to 6%, 12%, 18%, 24%, 30%, and 36%. 
That means at present the maximum tax rate is 18%, whereas as for this bill, the maximum tax rate goes up to 36%. Right. Then the expenditure relief, actually we were now, there's an expend earlier, the, the, now at present we have an expenditure relief up to 1.2 million per annum for each for all individuals. That 1.2 million covers various expenses like education, housing loan interest, then certain investments, uh, uh, medical insurance and medical expenses, things like that. Now that expenditure relief of 1.2 million, they are proposing to remove that input. Then next, hmm, the tax-free uh, interest allowance, actually the, in, Ma, in May 2022 this year, at that time, um, the president, uh, prime minister announced that they are reconsidering to grant the senior citizens 1.5 million tax-free interest allowance on the interest tax-free allowance of 1.5 million uh, he said that they are reconsidering to grant that, but that hasn't happened. Though they, though he mentioned at that time, it is not included into this bill. Then next, with relate to individuals, even if we are now at present, if we are doing a business in the field of gold, gem, and jewelry export business, uh, export business. Uh, that is that tax exemption on that is the uh, abolished that is abolished with effect from that is to be abolished with effect from 1st april 2023 then income tax exemption on it and it enabled services to local market is also abolishing with effect from 1st april 2023 now suppose an individual is providing any IT services to the local market, at present it is totally tax free, but they are proposing to remove that tax exemption. But this won't apply for the export. Export category, uh, the tax, uh, uh, that uh, export category continues. Then, because that ex under export category, I'll explain that later. Under export category, you can enjoy that under providing of services to be utilized abroad. That category, you can enjoy the benefit. Then, as I mentioned, until legalization of this bill, we, we need not to act according to this bill. Then we'll continue. They have proposed to introduce 15% mandatory tax on dividends. You all can remember with the effect from uh, 1st January 2020, government removed majority of the withholding taxes, including the withholding tax on dividend. Now they are proposing to reintroduce, but not at 14%, but at 15%. It is a final tax for any person, individual or corporate body, it's a final tax. Therefore, you need not to pay any further tax they are owed. The recipient need not to pay further taxes once he pay this 15%, that's the end. Then the government proposing to introduce 5% mandatory withholding tax on interest. On interest, 5% mandatory withholding tax, but this won't be a final tax. Therefore, when you are, when you are computing your personal taxation, you have to take the interest income as part of your accessible income, calculate your own you tax. For the tax amount, you can deduct that 5% withholding tax what we have already paid. Then, the, then, then the maximum income tax uh, limit of 14% on gem and jewelry uh, supply and electricity supply is abolished with the way from 10th october 2022 at present uh, on gem and jewelry and supply of uh, renewable energy to national grid is exempted there's a there's a uh, exemption on that 
that is uh, the 14 percent tax rate is on that that is uh, they are removing that 14 percent maximum limit now what will happen uh, under the current situation on these two type of income we are paying individuals are paying maximum of 14 percent but in future depending on that individual's income he may have to pay even 36 percent it goes up to 36 percent depending on the income then I have put, however, following existing income tax rate, this higher income tax rate of 40%. Now we have a higher income tax rate of 40% on liquor, tobacco, gambling, and lotteries, business income, not investment income, business income. If you are running, if you are running a gambling or lotteries business, that business income is liable at 40%. In the case of liquor or tobacco, if you will import and sell, sell, or if you will manufacture and sell, then only you have to pay 40%, not on um, uh, other retailers or buying and selling business. Then at the same time, IT rate, income tax rate on investment capital gains. Capital gains arising out of investment is continued to be uh, taxed at 10%. No change on that. In the case of individuals, no change on that. They announce a change on corporate bodies, companies, but not on individuals. Right. Now, with these changes, now as they are proposing to effect um, uh, most of these changes with effect from first October 2022, we you know some of these things they can backdate, some of these things they can't backdate. Things like withholding tax, definitely they can't backdate. Right. Anyway, uh, as they have mentioned that it, the, all these, uh, most of these things are effective from 1st October 2022, when you are preparing, once this is legalized, one, when you are preparing your personal taxation return for the year of assessment 2022-23, uh, first six months, you have to apply the existing basis and the balance six months, you have to apply the new basis on proportionate basis that means now even personal allowance for, for six months will be 50 percent of 3 million that is 1.5 million second period it will be uh, 50 percent of 1.2 million that is 600 thousand even the slabs first period you have to take 50 percent of the slabs second period you have to take the 50 percent of the slabs first period slabs 3 million then you have to take 1.5 million each if it is effective from this day then no changes now i have mentioned for better understanding for better clarity i have included these things no changes are proposed in the following income tax exemptions uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, individuals yes, request yeah. to put it for the full screen ah uh, yeah Mm -hmm. Now, isn't it uh, full screen now? Anyway, we'll continue, sir. So yeah. It's, yeah, now it's... A little bit okay, you know? Yeah. Improved here. Yeah. Right. Okay, now uh, no changes are proposed in the following income tax exemptions. Better to know what are the things which they have not changed also. Com uh, compensation and gratuity, that is a capital part of your, um, uh, if a person is receiving as a result of injuries or a death, uh, that part is exempt from taxation, that is continued to be uh, exempted. Then government pension of a person, it is continued to be exempt. Then employees retirement benefit receiving from um, uh, receiving 
also exempted from income tax, you can continue that. Then the income portion of any per, that is that is on income uh, portion of the pension funds, uh, EPF, then approved or regulated provident fund, all these are exempted under this retirement benefit. But in the case of, um, yeah, next, no? government employees road vehicle permit benefit. It is exempted from tax. No? That is continued to be exempted from tax. Then uh, amounts derived by senior citizens on life or uh, life annuities exceeding 10 years. This is to promote private sector uh, pension scheme. Now, suppose somebody has obtained this type of a facility through a bank or an insurance company. There are people who are providing this. If the term is more than 10 years, you get the exemption. That continues to be exempted. Then sale proceeds of gems on which 2.5% withholding tax is paid at the auction stage, then there won't be any further tax on that. This is applicable not only for individual, but also for other, business, other entities. Then services rendered in or outside Sri Lanka to be utilized outside Sri Lanka. That is export, we'll say export of services to be utilized outside Sri Lanka. If you will bring the proceeds through a bank to Sri Lanka in foreign currency, this, amount, this income is exempt from tax. Therefore, under this category, if you are in the in, uh, overseas IT business, if you are doing uh, online IT businesses to overseas, you can get the uh, exemption under this category, service export. Then any foreign source, they are what it says is any foreign source, but the condition earned or derived in foreign currency and proceed received through a bank to Sri Lanka, there's a tax exemption. This tax exemption, you can continue. Under this only now, a lot of our construction industry people, they go and do projects in abroad, earn money and remit that money to Sri Lanka. Then it is totally tax-free in Sri Lanka. These items continue to be uh, tax-free in Sri Lanka. Then I have included this small table that is to show the current tax rates. This is, these current tax rates are effective from 1st January 2020. Up to now, it is in, in um, uh, effect. In effect, right? What are the rates? Out of the taxable income, first three million at six percent, next three million twelve percent, balance at eighteen percent. That is how it is taxing. Then at the level of six hundred million income, we are at percent. We are paying five hundred and fifty thousand rupees, 550,000 rupees we are paying. That is without considering the, uh, uh, considering the taxable income of 6 million. Right. Then I'll move to the current system. Now the, uh, the thing which is proposing, this is the current situation. Now we'll see what is proposing. In this current thing, to arrive the taxable income, we have already deducted 3 million personal allowance. 3 million personal allowance, then even expenditure relief of 1.2 billion and various other reliefs and qualifying payments. After that only we get the taxable income. Now we will see how they are proposing to tax the um, uh, taxable income in future once these amendments are legalized. Practical application of persons allowance and standard IT rates. This is Proposed thing. This is the proposed situation. Personal tax free allowance instead of 3 million, as I mentioned, uh, they are giving only 1.2 million. Then, out of the taxable income, out of the taxable income, first 500,000 at 6%, next 512, next 518, next 524, next 530. That means up to 2.5 million. Now we have reached 2.5 million. Anything above 2.5 million excess at the rate of 36%. Now I have given a uh, accumulated a tax amount. Now see, 2.5 million level, we are paying 450,000 rupees. Anything above 205 million taxable income, we have to pay 36%. 
Now we will see uh, a comparison. It is very much important to have a comparison because now we know everybody are in a severe financial difficulty with relate to the cost of living due to mainly due to cost of living. In a situation like uh, that, we have to uh, think what is the increase in cost of tax. Right. Now, I have taken practical application of personal allowance and standard IT rates, but here I have taken included 1.2 million personal uh, uh, expenditure relief also, because generally every individual who has taken a proper tax advice may have already utilized, already enjoyed this 1.2 million, or they are enjoying 1.2 million. That's the stand. On that stand, I have done this calculation. Income tax computation after considering the existing expenditure relief of 1.2 million a year. If it is the situation, total income, if somebody is getting 350,000 rupees per month, that is 4.2 million a year, existing tax amount is zero. In future, that particular person has to pay 630,000 tax per annum. 630,000 tax per annum. This is annum, 630,000. Then at 400,000 level per month, uh, at present we are paying 36,000. In future, we have to pay 846,000 rupees. What is the increase? 810,000 rupee increase, that is 67,500 rupee increase at this level, monthly income of 400,000. It is huge, it is huge. Then at 450 level, the additional tax what we have to pay per month is 82,500 rupees, additional tax. At 500,000 rupee per month, the additional tax what we have to pay is 97,500 rupees per month. Then 550,000 rupee income level, monthly income level, you have to pay 112,500 rupees additional tax on that income. Then at 600,000 level monthly, 177,500 rupee additional tax per month. It is huge. Therefore, that is the very reason why uh, almost all individuals are grumbling, are talking on this matter because they can't manage the cost of living. Right. Now saying that, uh, that is, that's all with relate to the directly related to the individual's income taxation. I will move to the withholding tax, um, uh, the proposal what they have given under the withholding tax. Under the withholding tax, remuneration, uh, the Earlier we were using the word uh, ap, uh, the payee tax. Now we use the word APIT, the same thing. APIT made mandatory. At present, APIT is not mandatory for resident people. Now in future, resident and citizens. Now in future, APIT will be mandatory on all employees, residents, non-resident, or uh, citizens or non-citizens or whoever it is receiving remuneration exceeding 100,000 rupees per month because 1.2 million is the personal allowance. Right. That is mandatory. Then dividends. A lot of people are asking, uh, generally asking what is remuneration? What I have to say is remuneration mean any benefit what you are getting as a result of your employment contract. Any benefit what you are getting as a result of your employment contract. But if you are getting any other payment beyond the employment contract from your employer, not as a not as an employment benefit, then that won't cover under this. Right? There may be some other arrangements, nothing to do with employment contract. Then that won't come here. Right? Then dividends. As I mentioned, 15% mandatory final withholding tax is introducing. Then, uh, then interest and discounts, 5% mandatory withholding tax is introducing, but it is not a final tax. Then other payments, on other payments, they have proposed withholding tax of 14%. 
then rent in excess of 100,000 rupees per month, 10% withholding taxes, they are on the total. Suppose you are getting 99,000 rupees per month, you are paying 99,000 rupees per month, you are not supposed to deduct the withholding tax. Suppose you are paying 101,000 rupees per month to an uh, one person, then you are supposed to deduct 10% withholding tax on whole 101,000 rupees, not only on excess, but also on total. Right. Then non-resident service fee and infra the insurance premium, service fee and insurance premium, withholding tax at 14% on the payment. The person who is making the payment is supposed to deduct that and remit it to the revenue department. Without that, definitely you can't uh, remit that money. You can't get the remittances uh, passed through the bank. Then non-employment service, uh, service fees. That earlier here we, we covered remuneration. If it is non-employment remuneration in excess of 100,000 rupees per month, one payment, um, per, per monthly payments, the total 100, 000, more than 100,000, then you are supposed to deduct 5% withholding tax on the total. I think it's clear. Next, yeah. Next, hmm. the tax administration part. I have only five minutes more, right? Tax administration related things. I have included those things also for your better understanding. Estimate section 92A. Under section 92A, 92 of the Inland Revenue Act, you are supposed to file an estimated tax return uh, by 15th of August of the year of assessment. Now, if you the if you uh, not if you not file the tax return, estimated tax return, or even you file the estimated tax return uh, with an amount lesser than the immediate previous year's tax amount. Suppose previous year tax amount was 2 million. Now this year we estimated for 1.5 million, lesser than previous year's tax amount. And, and you, uh, you fail to through the commissioner general, you fail to, fail to uh, through the department that uh, that you have, uh, why you have underestimated that amount. If you fail to do that, then what will happen? You have the assistant commissioner is empowered to make an assessment of uh, the, the computation on that and advise you to pay according to that. Right. That means assistant commissioner should do that only if we have violated these two. One, if we have not filed, yes, then he, he can do that. Even if we have filed, uh, if the amount is lesser than the previous year's tax amount, then if we'll uh, not be able to prove why we have uh, estimated a lesser amount, then uh, assistant commissioner is empowered to issue an estimate. Then once he estimates it, we have to follow that estimate, okay? Now, anyway, here, the authority has given to the assistant commissioner under the existing law, some of these authorities under this is with the commissioner general. It has gone to a lower level office. Right. Appeal in time period, at present, once we get, the, get an assessment, we can submit the uh, request for review, request for review within 30 days of, uh, of receiving that. That 30 days is reduced into 14 days. Next, charging penalty. Now, um, this is in uh, section 179. It says this new amendment says, disregarding any extension granted by the Commissioner General for a delayed payment. Now, some occasions when we are having uh, financial difficulties beyond our control, we can request the Commissioner General to grant us a time period, extended time period to pay the tax. Right. Even, but it is the, if we'll enjoy that, we have to pay the interest on delay. It is fair because on interest on delay, we have to pay the interest. Right. But even after getting this permission, even after getting this permission, if we'll do like that, they consider that we have violated the law and charge 20% penalty. 
what I can't understand why they are charging the penalty when we have uh, acted um, after getting uh, approval from the Commissioner General. It is fair to charge penalty, uh, charge uh, interest, but not the penalty. I think it is not fair. Right. Next, hmm? other amendments to uh, finish off my part, other amendments. Claiming of tax losses, if it is a business loss, a loss in relation to now they are proposing to increase the tax rate from 14% to 30%, 18 to 30%, 24 to 30%. This, uh, suppose we have ended up with, we have an accumulated tax loss. During the past period, where the tax rate was 14, 18 or 24, now they increase in it to 30%. Then according to the existing law, you can't set off that against uh, uh, income taxable under a higher rate. But in this case, as they themselves, the legislator is increasing it, they have given the option, given, given the facility of setting off the losses incurred during the lower tax period against a higher tax period because of this. Then investment losses, the claimability of unrelieved investment losses, unenjoyed the investment tax losses, which we have not enjoyed yet, is limited to succeeding six years of assessment. That is, you can carry forward and set off for next six years of assessment. Then loss claimability against capital gains. No investment capital gains, to be no investment capital gains to be reduced uh, by any amount. When it is investment capital gain, the in, you can't reduce the investment capital gain by any other uh, losses, right? Therefore, in, on investment capital gain, not all capital gain, it is only on investment capital gain, you can't do that. I think that's all uh, for me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next on agenda is the presentation on the Inland Revenue Amendments Bill's provision related to the company taxation. Mr. S. Sulaiman, partner tax, Ernest and Young, an expert in the field of taxation, will deliver the presentation. Over to you, Mr. Sulaiman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kajinder. Um, I trust you can hear me and see my screen. Yes. I just put it on. Okay, right. Uh, so thank you, um, Sakadhiran and uh, CMA for inviting me to make this presentation on the corporate side of the changes introduced by the bill. Uh, so firstly, what I would like to say is this is not law yet. And I think we need to <clears throat> understand that uh, it is not law hence it can't be implemented yet. Uh, it has been uh, issued as a bill, uh, gazetted, and there is provision for uh, amendments, a challenge in the Supreme Court, as well as committee stage amendments, which may come. So this is uh, something to uh, sort of take in and absorb its impact to various uh, stakeholders, various industries, and the economy at large, and then where there was something detrimental uh, as a result, although in, in income is going up, if it is a detriment to sustainability or any other aspect that is uh, of a graver issue than raising that income uh, as stakeholders, we need to make those submissions to the Ministry of Finance. And I hope the Ministry of Finance will be open to such suggestions as uh, specified by the President yesterday in his speech that they're open to discussion. So. Uh, to start off with, uh, the this bill, uh, unlike most bills, uh, has several effective dates for several provisions, right? Uh, so it is complex to that extent, and we need to assess its impact carefully, uh, taking time because it's a lot of changes. Uh, and the four main significant dates of effectiveness I have highlighted in this slide. So the first date, of course, is October 1st, which is a date that has passed, right? It's, uh, October 1st is a date in the past. 
uh, and any <clears throat> changes coming into effect from October 1st, once this law and if this law is passed in the future, let's say November 1st week, for example, then these provisions will have retrospective effect. And this October 1st primarily applies to uh, the uh, introduction of or the removal of the uh, reduce or uh, the uh, concessionary rates given to various industries. So October 1st is, a, is one of the main dates that we need to look out for. And then we have some provisions coming into effect from the commencement of the amendment act. That means the date from which it gets passed. And that is the point. It is debated and passed in parliament and subsequently certified by the speaker. So uh, there are again, most of the withholding provisions come into effect on the date of commencement of the act. Right. So, for example, like APIT, uh, deduction, uh, withholding tax on interest, withholding tax on service payments coming to effect from the commencement of the member tax. Then the third date to look out for is April 1st, 2023. That is next year, uh, the starting of the year of assessment for the following year of assessment. Uh, and there, uh, most of the exemptions that are being given uh, are, coming, are going on till April 1st, 2023 and will uh, seize most exemptions. They are given uh, this whole year to run that exemption and it will seize on April 1st, 2023. Then interestingly, there are certain adjustments and amendments that have done which are coming into effect from going right back to April 1st, 2018. So these are things you need to look out for to see how it affects the returns that you have already filed because there can be implications <coughs> to something that was filed uh, on April uh, filed in 1819 is now being amended, right? With retrospective effect. Then April 1st, 2021, and April 1st, 2022. So that those are the basic effective dates that different different provisions in this bill seek to amend from. So what I've done is uh, I've gone into each of the significant industries that are getting impacted. And we'll just run through uh, what its impact is. So the first and the biggest surprise for us was the uh, impact to exporters, which is a significant uh, industry in our nation, significant contributor to our dollar earnings as well as employment, both exporters and indirect exporters. So for them, the rate, which was 14, is going up to 30. And this was not <clears throat> uh, introduced before in the mini budget or in the uh, cabinet um, uh, sort of statement that was given. Uh, so this is something new, 14 to 30 percent almost a doubling of the rates. And that is coming into effect from October 1st, if and when this bill gets passed. Uh, of course, most exporters had BOI agreements, and most of these BOI agreements have different rates, exemptions, reduced rates, uh, rates on turnover. So it's important to see if those BOI agreements have a reduced rate that can be applied over and above the rate in the general. So that has to be looked at carefully to assess uh, its effectiveness. Then supply of goods to exporters. So there are those deemed exporters who supply goods to exporters. They also were 14%. Now they are moving up to 30% from October 1st. Again, most of them were also uh, in the BY, uh, BY agreement regimes. So those also have to be looked at carefully to see its uh, impact, whether a reduced rate can actually be taken. Because now with this 30% rate coming in, I think uh, those rates would be very useful. Then we have provision of services to exporters, also a significant area uh, in the value chain of the export industry that too. Uh, will go up to 14, uh, go up 30 percent uh, from October 1st. So here, uh, for the first six months <coughs> uh, of the year, the 14 percent will apply. Like Atula mentioned, it's the same for corporates. Uh, and the second six months, you will have the uh, new rates coming in. Now, what is important to uh, Appreciate here is for both deemed exporter, the suppliers of goods to exporters and supply of services to exporters, both had the requirement to get that 14%. 
the requirement to get foreign currency from the exporter. They should have been paid in foreign currency. Now, with the mandatory conversion rules of the central bank for this first six months, exporters of both goods and services, they were not able to pay. Exporters are not able to pay because their exchange was getting mandatorily converted. Right? So that condition was not fulfilled even for the first six months. So to address that, this bill has um, brought in uh, a sort of a concession where exporters now don't have to pay in foreign currency, and where they were prevented from making the foreign currency payments to goods and service suppliers, they are now able to give a, uh, issue a confirmation of their foreign currency receipts for the purpose of uh, getting this concession for the first six months at least. For the second six months, it's not really relevant because they will be liable at 30% as well. Then the next significant industry in terms of investment and employment and uh, uh, gain is the manufacturing industry, which was earlier uh, liable at the highest rate. But uh, in the last two years, they had a concession rate of 18%, uh, which was also removed and will go up to 30% from October 1st, uh, 2022. So agriculture, one of the few industries that have been spared, well, I would say agriculture as a whole, but I would say agro-processing or rather agro-farming. Agro-farming has been spared and the initial exemption of five years that was given will continue. Right? It was given in 2019. So uh, that five-year tax exemption period of 20, up to 23-24 will uh, continue and there has been no amendment to that. So when you say agro-farming, it has a detailed definition which you can check in the internet of that, but primarily it is the primary growing of some sort of agricultural uh, produce, right? So uh, whilst the person who does agro-farming is also exempt, the person who uses his own agro-farming for agro-processing had a deemed exemption. So if you do your own growing of agricultural products and you take that same product and you do the agro-processing in your, that same company and sell it, then the transition from uh, agro-farming to agro-processing was given a deemed market value and you were able to claim an exemption for that deemed profit. Right? So that also is open and will continue. So uh, some concession for the agro-farming industry Agro processing, however, that is the primary processing of uh, the agro farm products, will, however, cease. That was 14%. Now that will stop and it will go up to 30% with effect from October 1st, 2022. Uh, there is a further concession. If you use agro farming produce in the course of agro processing or manufacture, uh, <clears throat> the term of availability of the 25% relief. Uh, on the tax payable of such persons has been reduced from five years to two years again. Uh, so that is something uh, that is also uh, going to continue uh, the additional 25% relief for agriculture. Then gem and jewelry industry, one of the uh, few industries that had an exemption for export of goods uh, uh, will now cease. Right? This has been an exemption. It has come and gone, uh, you know, it's been on and off. Uh, but it was made exempt last year as well. But now that is going to uh, go on till April 1st, 2023. And thereafter, it will go up to 30%. So there is a very significant increase there um, in terms of going from zero to 30. However, they do have the additional six months. They won't, it won't be immediate. It will be till this end of this year of assessment and thereafter, the 30% will come in. <clears throat> right, so we have the IT and BPO services uh, and services for Ankara. So if you have uh, IT, which had a specific exemption uh, for a specified scope, <clears throat> specified scope of uh, services, which was gazetted, right? It is there is a gazette for IT and enabled services, defining what it is and its parameters for both income tax, there's one gazette, and for VAT, there's another gazette. The income tax part, 
uh, will continue until uh, 2023, April 1st. So like I told you, the exemptions they have allowed to go for the whole year, <clears throat> they're not cut that in half. But from the zero, IT and IT uh, enable services will go up to 30% from April 1st, 2023. Shipping and logistics and warehouse, another favored industry. Most of these industries were coming under specified undertakings, uh, which were liable at 14% from entrepot trade, uh, front end services, offshore business, headquarter operations, transshipment, and freight forwarding. All had a uh, comfortable 14% earlier. Uh, all of that will cease and go to 30% from uh, October 1st. Uh, the shipping industry also had this final withholding tax of 2%. Uh, which was payments to non-residents for uh, land, sea, and air transportation that will continue as a final withholding to the non-resident. And then also uh, an exemption for dividends, one of the very few dividend exemptions, uh, I think probably the uh, very few, because other exemptions are removed, uh, is the dividend distributed by a company providing hub services under the Finance Act. Finance Act has a definition of what these hub services are, so you fall in that first. Plus, you need to have a BOI agreement as well. So once those two conditions are met, such companies, dividend distribution will be exempt. <coughs> uh, then warehousing also, there were two concessions. Exemption for letting bonded warehouses has to be discontinued. And the concession rate for bonded warehousing uh, also discontinued as well. Then another area we were all expecting to uh, take off and uh, sort of help the economy in terms of <clears throat> raising foreign currency has also been hit. Uh, like all other industries, uh, hotels, uh, outbound to operators and all those who came under the tourism definition, uh, which were registered with the tourist board, all were 14 earlier, all going to go up to 30%. So here, uh, whether the government will look at non-fiscal benefits uh, for this industry, uh, given that it's just recovering and hopefully it will recover with some stability coming in, um, is something that uh, they should look at uh, in order to revive it. Education, um, again, had a 14% uh, to go up to 30% from October 1st. However, government-assisted private schools, the exemption is going to continue. Uh, and then now with the implementation of the withholding tax regime, uh, I think educational institutions now have to look at uh, withholding uh, on payment, service payment made to lecturers, teachers who are not employed with them. Uh, healthcare, again, um, another area that was identified for a reduced rate to go up from 14 to 30% from October 1st. And here again, a significant issue that has come up is the withholding tax payments to uh, payments doctors who are also individuals and who are providing services. And this withholding tax also will now have to be deducted on all payments over the threshold mentioned. Then we have small and medium enterprises. So <clears throat> small and medium enterprises also at a 14%, but now, uh, so even if you make a hundred thousand rupee profit, you will have to pay thirty percent. There is no slabs given. So uh, starting a fresh, starting a small and medium business in a company is now challenging, especially if you're a startup. So maybe you need to look at alternate methods of setting up. Uh, but any SME that is in operation now will be um, liable at thirty percent from October first going forward. On the investment side. Um, on the listed entity side, there was this concession. Um, there was a three-year concessionary rate, which was uh, given to those who listed uh, on a particular date. And that was 14% uh, was given. That also has been prematurely stopped uh, on October 1st, 2022. So that will result in, you know, those who did list in that particular time, they spent a lot of money. Uh, investors have thought that this is going to be the rate and you get out of the three years, only six months uh, appears to have been given. Uh, but in the discussions we had uh, in several other panels, I think 
uh, the ministry has realized that uh, uh, this may have to be looked at and there was some positive sentiment uh, in relation to uh, allowing this for the full term or at least a, a slightly longer term. So that's something we need to look out for. And then the exemption, <clears throat> the taxation of gains on the sale of listed shares uh, will continue. So here, uh, I'm not sure what the rationale is um, to continue this exemption, but we should also realize that if you do make it liable, then the losses, which can be quite significant, the stock market would also probably then have to be uh, allowed. So that exemption is continuing, the exemption on uh, quoted shares, or on the uh, gains and profits from quoted shares. Then there are a very significant change is the uh, capital gains uh, rate for corporates. It was 10% all this time, and that is going up to a significant 30% on the realization of an investment asset, right? So there is no differentiation now in terms of an investment asset or the asset of the business. Both will be taxed at uh, 30%. Uh, in addition to that, in capital gains, <coughs> uh, we also have the uh, section 46.4, uh, which provides for the deferment of tax on a transaction of assets between associated parties. That too has been made a bit stringent and interestingly, that has sorry come in with retrospective effect. So if uh, certain transactions you have done uh, in the past using 46.4, you may want to relook at it to see how this amendment will impact those transactions. Right, so that was basically how this rate and the different industries, how they really get impacted. Um, so from there, we do want to, from the rates and the exemptions and how that impacts each industry to the deductions, right? Deductions are not many in this bill, uh, but there are a few significant ones. Uh, the first uh, is the uh, deductibility of a levy or a tax, right? Uh, they are uh, linking it to <coughs> that specific uh, statute having a specific allowability clause. If it does have an allow, if it disallows, if that particular statute disallows the levy or the tax, then it's going to be disallowed for income tax as well. So for example, if you take SSCL now, the SSCL law uh, does not restrict the deduction for income tax. Therefore, SSCL will be allowed as a deduction is the understanding based on this amendment. Uh, the next change is the limitation to utilize money during the year with regard to debt obligations uh, has been removed. So there is no requirement to utilize the money during the year uh, for the purpose of the interest expense deduction. Then uh, the third one, and this also uh, has a retrospective effect, which needs to be uh, evaluated. Deductions for improvements of fully depreciated assets to be claimed over 12 years for buildings and three years for other assets. So earlier, the repair section, if you recall, had uh, any improvements, if you had, you were able to claim capital allowance. Now, that section technically can't be used for fully depreciated assets because you don't have a uh, carry a sort of a tax written down value for tax because it's fully depreciated. So now they're specifying that if it's an asset that's fully depreciated that you're doing an improvement on, then <clears throat> uh, you can claim it, that improvement value for 12 years if it's a building. And if it's any other asset, you can claim it for three years. Right, then the total capital allowance is granted is limited to the cost of depreciable asset. That's generally how the formula works, but they seem to have reiterated it perhaps uh, because there was uh, no restriction there, but generally you wouldn't claim more than the cost of the asset in terms of your capital allowance. Uh, on losses, there are amendments. So business or investment losses incurred at reduced rates are to be carried forward at the subsequently increased rate. So we have a lot of lower rates that have moved to a higher rate, right? From the 14 to the 30, and and so forth even in the past. So this also has a retrospective effect, this uh, provision. And it appears that some losses may be deducted against any profits at the higher rate, right? So if a loss that you made when you were, let's say an SME, SME was provided last year, but let's say a hotel, 
uh, and now it's becoming 30. So that loss is now going to qualify as a 30% loss by bringing in this amendment. So that's a uh, relief that has been brought in. Uh, and then the significant deduction of uh, Markham expenses, additional deduction uh, of uh, two times uh, is to be limited only for two years. It was given for three years. They are limiting it for two years up to April 1st, 2023. Right, so I think Atula uh, covered the administration part. So with that, uh, Professor, I'll hand over to uh, Mr. Gajendra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Swayman. Next on agenda is the panel discussion and a question and answer session, which will be moderated by Mr. Duminda Pulangamo, Head of Tax for Partner Ernest and & Young and Deputy Vice Chairman, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Joining us as panelists are Mr. Suresh Pereira, Principal <coughs> Tax Secretary at KPMG, Mr. K. Sivanesan, tax consultant and senior partner, Amrasagar and Company, Dr. D. Kuladungu Rajabaksha, Group Chairman of DSI, and Mr. Mahendra J. Sagra, Managing Director of Langa Tiles PLC and Chairman CMA SP. We invite you to send your <coughs> question and answer question using the QA. Over to you, Mr. Dulangamu. Uh, thank you, uh, Rajendran. Uh, for some reason, I don't think my camera is on. You'll have uh, stopped it, is it? Well, we can see. No, it's on. You can. Uh, ah, okay. I cannot see it on the slide. Mm. Okay. I cannot see myself, but it's on, right? You can see me. Yes. Yes, yes it's on. Oh, I guess I have the screen. Okay. Um, yeah, I know how that is. I'm getting an empty screen. No, no. You're coming on the top one. That's normal. But we can okay. see you on the full screen. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Top pause. I can't see anything. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll get it sorted out. No. Right. Um, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thank you, Professor, for inviting me to uh, uh, moderate the session uh, on the new Inland Revenue uh, Bill. Um, so we have listened to the two tax experts, uh, namely uh, uh, on personal tax and uh, on corporate tax. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, we'll listen to the industry actually now since all the increases, uh, you know, we tax experts, uh, as myself, uh, uh, Suleiman, Atula, and uh, Suresh, Sivanesar, we can all uh, uh, discuss, analyze, and bring this message to people. But the real people who are affected are the, is the private sector and enterprises who are in business. Uh, so, maybe may I first turn to uh, Mahendra Jayasekra? If I draw to leave early, so I will first uh, turn to Mahendra. Uh, Mahendra, you're on. You can uh, hear me. Yes, I am on. I mean, yeah. So, Mahendra, my uh, question to you is: uh, uh, You know, your industry, you're representing manufacture and export, and a, and a very big industry, the tile sector. Uh, I know it's difficult uh, to pay increased taxes. Uh, but given the current situation uh, the government country is facing and uh, the uh, climate in which we are operating, uh, how do you view these taxes uh, as a private sector? I mean, looking at the larger economic, your company, the industry, uh, employees, uh, all that, and looking at the larger impact of this, what is your view? As a person. Yes, uh, Duminda, yeah, I must uh, thank the, the Institute for uh, giving me this opportunity. But uh, Duminda, actually, uh, from the, the corporate sector, from our industry, what I have to say is that, uh, I mean, the, uh, there is uh, no uh, uh, misunderstanding on this as to the need to raise money. The government needs to raise money given the current uh, economic situation because the government revenue has fallen drastically uh, due to, uh, of course, uh, ill-conceived, ill-planned uh, taxation policies we have implemented over the last so many, probably I would say not years, decades even, right? That is because we have not taxed the people who ought to pay taxes properly. So that is one thing. Now, the other thing is, of course, yes, these taxes 
are going to be a huge burden on companies as well as our employees. Actually, so much so, uh, a lot of our employees, in fact, speak to me and say that all this time they were not uh, thinking of uh, leaving the country. But if these taxes are implemented, their disposable income will drop so much and they will find it difficult to, to actually live. So, so, so it's a it's a difficult call. Now, the I, I want to, I, I will look at it. I see a bigger picture uh, like this. Now, at the moment, all of us know that we have overburdened government, right? We have a huge expenditure incurred, uh, being incurred to run this, uh, you know, largely inefficient government. Now, in raising taxes, when the government tries to raise taxes, there is a uh, there is a duty by the government to come and tell the people why these taxes are being raised and for what purpose it is going to be used. That is of paramount importance. Do mean that you don't like to be pickpocketed, right? But you would willingly take your wallet out and give money to various uh, people for various purposes. Why you do that? Because you see a clear purpose for which you are giving this money. But here, the problem is people really don't understand. They have no idea as to why this money is being raised and for what purpose. We know the government needs money, but how this money is going to be used, nobody has any idea. Unfortunately, so far, Minister of Finance or anybody in the government has not come forward and say this money will be used like this. But uh, in line with the increase in taxes, in line with the, the, the increased taxes you all are going to pay, we are going to reduce our cost like this. Because in a company also, if you are taking, if you are asking people to take a salary cut, then we should go and tell, uh, demonstrate to employees that, okay, why we cut salaries, we cut these expenditures also. Otherwise, the people will not cooperate. So that I see as a, as a big problem uh, with regard to this whole concept of increasing taxation. Now, the thing is actually, uh, uh, what we have to see is that while we try to increase taxes, we have to understand the government does not take any pragmatic steps to, to increase the tax base. There are lots of people who should pay tax. They are not paying taxes. Guminder, I think, actually, uh, 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 I think 90% of the audience here are accountants. I think as a single professional group, accountants must be the, the biggest taxpayers as a profession. As a profession, we must be paying highest amount of taxes. We must be contributing. Uh, to the tax uh, tax revenue uh, the most. But as accountants, we have to demand accountability for these uh, taxes we are going to pay. Otherwise, what will happen is, basically, we will have a lot of people, you know, prof even professionals leaving the country. And I really, I hate to say this, but I wonder whether there is another plan by the government to get rid of professionals from this country and, and run an illiterate state. So, I mean, in conclusion, what I want to say is that, yes, there is a big burden on corporate. It's a big burden on uh, uh, employees and employees burden will, will translate uh, to a burden on the companies again, because the companies will have to, to look at somehow increasing the, 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 the income of our employees. Otherwise, we will be losing our employees as well. So, so actually, I mean, what we have before us is Hobson's choice, really. So, I mean, it's a very difficult call. We will be, I think, running through a very difficult time. And I think it is, it is of paramount importance that we, that we demand accountability uh, for this uh, money that is going to be raised as uh, taxes. Duminder. So, in a nutshell, that is how I want to summarize the impact of this taxation. Yes. So, thank you. Thank you, Mahendra, for that comment. Uh... Uh, if I just uh, pick on that again and ask a question, uh, Mahendra, I'm just paying the role of devil advocate here. I know sure. you, we all come from the same profession um, and uh, you know we have the same beliefs and values. Uh, you know, if, if I put it this way, yes, I, I get your point with regard to transparency and accountability of government expenditure. Even the Chamber of Commerce, we raised that issue with the government. Uh, you know, there has to be transparency and accountability in government expenditure. But on the other hand, if you take, yes, uh, you know, uh, 
the government expenditure has also benefited the people at large. For example, we run a state sector, maybe overemployed, inefficient, I don't know. Uh, but they are employed and their lifestyles have to be, I mean, they have to be kept employed and otherwise they have no income. So we, we, so we benefit from having a group that is giving money, but otherwise there can be social uprising because if there is unemployment in that sector. Number, number two, we also benefit from having free education, free health, uh, free roads, uh, free municipal council services. So a lot of things are coming free as well, which we have taken to, for granted. Now, I am not agreeing with you a little bit to say that there is corruption, there is wastage, all that is right. But having said that, there is also a benefit that we as people have received over the years uh, through this expenditure of the government also. Is that a fair statement to make? No, actually, your statement is a fair statement to make. I have no dispute on that, uh, Duminder. Actually, that's why I'm saying uh, uh, I'm, I'm not for a moment advocating not paying taxes. Actually, it is not about the rate, whether it is 20% or 30% or 40%. People will willingly pay, I am sure, if the purpose for which uh, uh, they are collecting money is clearly shown. I mean, all this time, yes, we have paid taxes, but the problem is it is the same people who have been paying taxes. So that is why I said, if, if, there, is a, if there is a more transparent and a pragmatic attempt to, to increase the tax base and get, get the tax people who should be paying taxes to in fact pay taxes, then I think this problem can be, you know, the effect can be mitigated really as least. At least uh, for, for a moment even, I, do, I have no argument with you uh, that uh, the taxes need to be paid and uh, and it brings in benefits, free health, free education and all that. No question about that. All what I'm saying is it is not about the rate or the amount of tax we pay. You know, for what purpose we are paying uh, these taxes should be uh, established. Uh, yes, yes. That's yes. all so that's, what I'm saying. No, I, I, that's, that's good. So I, I want that also the answer also to come from you. Uh, yeah. Mahindra, how long do you have to stay because you said you have to leave? Uh, Another 10 minutes, 10, 10 minutes. Uh, 10 so can I, go to, can I go to Mr. Rajapaksa and come back to you? Sure. Uh, Mr. Rajapaksa, you are there, right? I can ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, oh. yeah, you want to say anything uh, before I ask a question or you want to ask a question? Yes, you can ask a question. Yeah. So Mr. Rajapaksa, I know, I mean, the question to you, I mean, we have been discussing this category in the last few months or years. I mean, they brought a super gains tax and then they took away large amount of profits of the corporate sector, right? And the super gains tax uh, was brought also uh, uh, referring, referring to uh, various uh, expenditure, COVID, all these things, and you know that took away a substantial portion of corporate profits. And now they have brought, uh, now they have brought the increase in taxes. So every time the taxes are increased, there's some reason or other the government come up with and when they can't find uh, avenues of revenue or avenues to meet expenditure, uh, where they exhausted all forms of borrowing, all forms of resources, the only person that they resort to is the taxpayer and that is of the genuine and the real taxpayer. So um, you had, I know, experiences in all these taxes. So uh, and as an industry person, you have fought right through, I know, uh, on these matters. Uh, do you think cash in your hand as a business, you're better off? Then your cash in the hands of the government to provide to the people. What is your view on that? Well, if you ask cash, of course, cash in my hand would be better off than the government. That's a very simple answer. But at the same time, I would mention, I totally agree with what Mr. Mahendra Jayasekar mentioned, that we are taxing the people who are already paying taxes. That is, we are trying to squeeze them, squeeze them. Right? So as uh, Mr. Jayasekar mentioned, we have to widen the tax net. That is one of the important sectors that will be done, that has not been done. Then 30% income tax, it is across the board, all are 30% now. So now it is whether it is export, uh, value added exports or value added local market or uh, That's okay. tourism, all even in SME are now liable at 30%. I think there's an anomaly in that. In my, I, I, I feel there's a serious anomaly on that. As exporters who are doing value addition, they should. They have been given fourteen percent. Now it's time to thirty percent. I think they should have some something in between. Some concession should be given because they are they are dollar earners, which is widely which is extremely important today. Then the other local industries are dollar savers. They also must be considered some sort of concession. 
then they are taking the traders also to the same boat. Traders, of course, there is no value addition at all. They import and sell. So I think they also go to the same level. So I think there is there is an anomaly in that because industries are not doing industry just for one or two years. They have a long term plan. Four pay plans are five ten years running. So they have to plan their investment well ahead. In the case of uh, traders, of course, they import and sell. There is no in, there is no what you call employment much. But as far as we are concerned, we are giving employment. We can't terminate them also. We can understand. And Mr. Mahendra said very correctly said. We also have a same situation that people start start leaving. So that means our talent is leaving. So we are finding it difficult to manage. Then other thing is, uh, with thirty percent bank interest rate today, and thirty percent income tax rate, what will be the cash flow situation of any company? There will be have no cash for reinvestments. Without reinvestment, the companies will not grow. And especially companies, like export grading companies, have to upgrade their technologies. Every year, which is costing heavy big amount, so that will not happen. And both local and export industries, the technology up upgrading, in investing in machinery will not take place. That will have a long-term impact, especially in industries who need updating every year. Uh, otherwise, other other in countries are updating the technology, and therefore they will be have a competitive margin. Then there is another area that I did not see in the presentation. There is a relief grant for marketing and uh, communication have been withdrawn. I don't know whether the same thing has happened to R and D, where they were given two hundred or three hundred percent tax reduction. Whether that is silent, I presume that is still remaining. Then all of us were expecting the simplification of taxes, but that is also not happening now. Then, uh, as far as in the Indian Department is concerned, they are covered all their things very well covered. Even the even the periods that they have given for thirty days have been brought down to fourteen days. They are from that side they have covered, but at the same time they should look into the taxpayer side. On the taxpayer side they have not done anything because we have understanding that they have been further squeezed. Never mind. I don't have disagreement with collecting taxes because government will take it. And at this and then today's context definitely the tax collection is important. But the question here is why is the tax in the people who are already honestly paying taxes? What happened to the parties who are not paying taxes now? Today on the media, you see billions have been deposited in accounts, and these and they are they are they are getting off scot free. I don't know what the uh, Indian government is doing. Then those people can be easily get caught by the system that we do have. Then the three years time by they are available for taxes, and uh, as usual, before expiry of the three years, there is another assessment can take uh, can be issued and another. Two another two years are being covered by the tax department. Now with the digital age, I see no reason why we have such an extended period. The, the tax department can work efficiently and bring down all the. But these are all overheads to operate that we are working. So I think that must be looked into because the digitalization will be now as far as companies are concerned. You mentioned Jaisi Agrawal will end it. All are trying to do lean production now. We are going to bring down inventories, lead time, everything, everything. Now even exports. They want the delivery done, but within will be reduced. If they say three months, they say you, we go to another supplier. So now, if all the things in the industry sector have been reduced, the lead time, everything has been reduced with the lead production, lead inventory, all that. I think the same thing should apply to the industry department as well. They also must bring in the lean concept and reduce the lead times. Then this, all these must be brought. Now they have brought down the 30 days period to 14 days. But they have not reduced others here. So then the taxpayer side also they must look into. Uh, what I say is, we have learned in Singhala, mala nutala rang ron ganu. Then make mala talarari ron ganu. That is also not correct. That is what happened here now. Then uh, the uh, 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 yeah. other point what I want to mention is the as Mr. Jayasekar mentioned, the tax collect the, the collected taxes, the transfer must be give, uh, explained. And I want to see my own experience. If you raise the tax from 14% to 30%, I take a bet the total revenue collection will be same. That is the principle in science also. Whenever there is a change in the system, the system adjusts itself to nullify the change. That will happen in the tax department as well. And also the serious thing that uh, that has been taken place, I think they will do a correction. The collecting tax on retrospective effect. That is a very another serious matter that we have to seriously consider because we as Private companies, we manage our cash flows very carefully. We have a cash flow plan. We have a corporate plan. If you try to tax prospectively, we have to find cash. If you want to find cash, then we have to go for banks, which is at thirty percent interest. 
So that means the companies will crash. So then that means you are killing the goose laying the golden next. That's going to happen. So therefore, that's what I mentioned. At the end of the period, there are some companies will collapse. The revenue collection may be almost the same, even with increased taxes. And uh, another point, uh, serious matter that I thought was agro processing. That's a vital requirement today to, to process the agriculture product, not to export the raw product. But that also has been brought down from if, if the same company is doing it, it's okay, but uh, same company normally won't do it. There's another company which only do the processing part of it. That has been withdrawn, and that's also going to be disincentive for agriculture sector. They will not start doing processing because the, out, only after processing, you get higher foreign exchange, every, higher prices. So that is also not happening. These are the few things that I would mention about the budget. So uh, if there are any other questions, I am prepared to answer. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Rajapak, for the elaborate uh, answer. I know your frustration level. So uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope we will be, there will be some kind of solution even in the long term. I don't know. Uh, Mahendra, uh, before yes. you go, can I ask a yes. question uh, from you? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll come to the others because Mahendra has to go. That's why I'm raising the question. Mahendra, now, uh, Dr. Rajapak said his valid question uh, or from his side about this uh, concessionary rates for exports and SMEs uh, versus the others. Yes. Uh, and this time they have a uniform tax rate of 30%. Yes. Uh, maybe too high. It should have been 32%, 24% in my view. Uh, but then those are the figures give the government. But yes. what is your view about this? Uh, different, I mean, there are different arguments for and against this. Whilst uh, one, some would argue, yes, you must give preference to exporters, maybe the dollars to the country. Uh, so it's a priority sector. At the same time, uh, Raja Parker said that, you know, uh, SME sector is priority. So while others are arguing, okay, why should I pay higher tax? For example, the banking sector will say I have to pay 60% tax because you are paying less tax. So why should everyone pay the same amount of tax? Uh, because you're paying, after all, you're paying tax on your profits, not on your, your activity. So profit is the same for everyone. And therefore, there's another theory I'm bringing, right? People are saying, yeah. therefore, it should be equal. What is your sort of as an industry person, what is your view on that? No, actually, I would answer it like this. Now, if you take uh, objectives of taxation, there are two key objectives of taxation. One is to raise government revenue. Number two is to uh, uh, allocate, reallocate resources or use it as a driver to reallocate resources to drive economic growth. Right? Now, uh, here what we, what we have to see is whether the government is using taxation as a tool to allocate resources to the sectors of the economy that should be promoted to drive economic growth. Now, if you are giving preferential tax rates, then those th that decision should be based on that, th that criterion because the government should clearly identify, okay, what are the sectors where we need more resources uh, going in so that those, those sectors will bring in growth to the economy. Now that objective has been completely neglected and forgotten. So this time, I think the revenue, I think revenue is the foremost in the in the mind of the government in coming up with this taxation policy. So actually, my simple answer to that is I am not against preferential rates of tax. Really, there could be preferential rates of tax, and there there, there should be also because. I mean, small companies could be taxed at a uh, at a lower rate. Higher, bigger companies can be taxed at a at a at a slightly higher rate. You know, all these things can be done if the government clearly identifies where the government thinks the the growth will come from, and the government should you know give those preferential rates and make sure that those are implemented properly to achieve the desired objective. Really. So I have no uh, uh, problem about preference preferential rates. Actually, I am not a person who, ad who advocates unified rate of tax of all uh, companies, whether it's trade or exports or whatever. There can be different rates, but then the objective should be clear. People should know what that objective is. Then the resources will go into those sectors and the economy will grow. That is exactly what we are missing in these tax proposals. Uh, so, so what you are saying is that the uh, cost of taxation or the benefit of the economy should be greater than the cost of taxation. Definitely. So there's a larger benefit, then there's a, you can forego the tax because it's a bigger benefit to the economy that you get by that. Okay. Thanks. Thank Definitely. you, Mahendra. Otherwise, the economy uh, has a whole new contract. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mahendra, for those values. Thank you. Uh, if you can input me. Uh, yes. Thank, thanks a lot, thank uh, thank you. Mahendra. Thank you. Uh, 
right. So now uh, there are four tax experts. I don't know whom to turn to. So uh, may I first go with uh, Suresh? Uh, Suresh, what is uh, your Suresh? You can uh, see and hear me, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So Suresh, uh, you know uh, this presentation. Uh, I think both Suleiman and uh, uh, Mr. Rajapaksa also uh, mentioned. Uh, about this uh, administrative provisions that have been changed uh, that are affecting the time bar provisions for appealing, etc. Uh, what I want to ask you is, yes, there is a reduction in that. And then on the hand, is there also a reduction in the time due to the assessor also to make an assessment? So have they equated that or is it one-sided in terms of the change they have made? Yeah, actually, uh, that's a good question, uh, Duminda. So what we see is, uh, as uh, Abdullah pointed out, uh, 30 days uh, period uh, for, uh, for appealing has come down to 14 days. So one hand, it looks okay, taxpayer is being uh, penalized here. And then also when you go, uh, look at the proposals, you can see that 30 day period that is there for the access of the department to acknowledge the appeal, it's also reduced from 30 day, 30 day to 14 days. So it seems to be that they're trying to say that, okay, we are cu cutting the period for the taxpayer as well as we are cutting our period also. It's, it's kind of a balance. But when you analyze, it is not the case because if the time period taken for, by the department to hear the uh, matter or to raise, even to raise assessments, those time periods uh, remain the same. It's only that 30 day period that is there to issue the acknowledgement that is going down so it, it's it's the way that they have designed this to me is a little bit uh, how do i say not very honest it's basically we are penalizing the taxpayer but trying to camouflage it by uh, trying to say that okay we have also reduced our 30 days to 14 days it, it's not uh, matching because uh, the 14 days uh, 13 days 13 days 30, 30 days that has been reduced is only in relation to uh, acknowledging the appeal so that is not uh, what should have happened. Either the time bar, time bar for raising the assessment or the time period for hearing the appeal or something of that nature should have been uh, changed. Not, not just trying to camouflage saying that, okay, we have reduced yours and uh, we have reduced ours also. So it's, it's not uh, a fair argument. So yeah, with regard to that, yes, there's grievance. And I think uh, we should all uh, uh, expect the government to hopefully the government will change that. It's not a fair change uh, the argument. So also, Suresh, on the same lines, uh, on these uh, estimated payments, also there is an issue uh, where the assessor has been given uh, the right to uh, estimate the tax. I mean, we know the assessor can estimate or rather assess uh, tax on return file if he doesn't agree with the uh, tax that we have returned. But estimate is an estimate, which is not judgment. Now, even that he can reject and make his own estimate. So is that very fair. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, unheard of, right? That kind of uh, amendment. Yeah, actually, actually, the I mean, it's they are already in the in the original act. Also, this this power was there for under certain circumstances for the commissioner general to uh, issue uh, the estimate right. under certain classes, right? But then that power was restricted to the commissioner general. Now here, this power has been devolved on the assistant commissioner. So any person down the below. Uh, according to his whims and fancies, can go ahead and uh, raise oh. estimates. And once those estimates are raised, and they are, if you don't uh, comply, and there are going to be consequences on taxpayers. So sometimes when you look at this, now we want to basically uh, we, we we talk about the all all powerful executive presidency in Sri Lanka. It is that that should be uh, uh, changed. But uh, then I think. Uh, with regard to the taxpayers, uh, this is uh, this is uh, how do you say unfettered powers given to an assistant commissioner to tell what uh, the taxes that you and I should obey. Sure, which sure. uh, which is not uh, correct. I know, I know. Uh, thank you, Suresh. I'll come back to you uh, later on with the other question. But let me direct to Mr. Sivanesan. You are there, Siva? Yes, Siva. Ah, yes. Hi, Siva. Uh, Siva, the question to you I want to pose is on this, uh, especially the PAY taxes. Now, the law has not been passed and very unlikely it will get passed before end of October, mm -hmm. uh, by which time all the companies uh, would have paid salaries to employees. 
So they will have to deduct based on the existing uh, tax rates. Uh, but once the law is passed, it will come with uh, effect from 1st October, uh, retrospective of the nature. So in that case, how can an employee uh, who's liable to tax at the higher rate from October uh, pay his taxes for November onward? Because if you deduct the whole amount, October and November, the total amount from the November salary, it will be a significant amount. Uh, what is the mechanism or scheme? Are you aware where they have come up with? Where some relief have given to the employee to pay it in installments or where he can pay on his own by any, 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 any views you can express on that? Yes. Uh, according to this, uh, this schedule, what is given is the first six months has to be taxed at a lower rate. Or I could say it's a previous review. So after 1st October 2022, it's a, at the higher rate. So therefore, though now if the employees are getting certain amount on the October 1st, October 1st onwards, it should be at a higher rate technically. But the, the deduction of API is applicable mandatorily once the bill is certified by the speaker. So therefore, there's a small confusion. I agree with you. If that's the possibility, you are getting paid now in October, which is not subject to API. But technically, that has to be declared it is not deducting the any of the APIT, so he has to declare that as a higher rate of income, liable at higher rate. Yes. So he there can be some installment scheme. Uh, yes. I guess trying to pay if he has to tax file or something like that. That's there. Uh, see, our next question is also to you uh, <clears throat> on this uh, capital gain versus business profits. There was a person who the made. Can you clarify that? What it really means, some person of the audience asking actually, the question, yeah, what, you can actually, say is what, what is the current law and what is the proposed law, if you can briefly explain. Yeah, actually, I mean, the, now, now the, the capital asset, I think you must be knowing the capital asset, if it is used for the business purpose, you are categorizing that as a business asset, which is liable at the, as a business income. Maybe you can tell as a normal rate or business tax, tax rate applicable to the business. But we are the same capital asset if you're using for the for the investment purpose that become an investment asset. So that we generally call the capital gains. With the capital gain calculation, you can apply the market value basis. The cost of acquisition would have been if the asset was held as of 30th September 2017. You can deduct the market value as of 30th September 2017 and find out the gain, and you can tax at 10% rate. So going forward, there's no difference since the business rates have got changed from most of the business rates are 30%. So the business asset realization will continue to be at 30% rate. But the question here is a capital gain tax, which was taxed at 10% for a corporates, also going to be increased to a 30%. So principally, I believe it's a, it's a basically uh, basically, a fundamental principle in taxation is that any appreciation of capital for long term should be taxed at a lower rate of tax. This is the basic principle, the capital gain, not only in Sri Lanka, in other countries also, the capital gains are taxed at reduced rate of tax. But if you're going to apply the long term capital appreciation, if you're going to tax at the current tax rate, so there's no logic on that. So they were basically, this is more against the, the basic principle in tax, I believe. Uh, thank you, Siva. I'll come back to you with another question. I'll do the round and I'll now go to uh, Atula. Atula, can you hear me? You're yes. online? Yeah. Atula, the question to you is on terminal benefits. Yeah. Uh, can you, I know you explained a slide, but a bit more elaborately, uh, the person is asking uh, with the same exemption that is there now on the current law be available to the person once the new law comes into effect? Any, any changes to the EPF? Any terminal benefit, gratuity, all those things? Yeah, with related to these things, there aren't any changes what they have proposed in this uh, bill. Therefore, uh, all employees can enjoy these benefits uh, even in future. There won't be any limitations. So there won't be any change. People will then, for example, who are retiring, uh, whether he retires today or whether he retires in December, there is no change to his compensation, rather uh, to his terminal benefit, the power EPF, ETF, and the gratuity. The same yes. rate applicable. Yes. So what about the gratuity also be the same rate, uh, Atula, or it be different rate? 
No, even creativity that rates are continuing. The rate okay, is continuing. That's a lower rate for that, no? Yes. You can, you can continue to apply that. Right. Uh, then there's a question, Atula, on uh, on uh, treasury bill, treasury bonds. Whether treasury bill, treasury bonds, a person earning will be liable to any withholding tax uh, or not. That's a good question. I think uh, now it is government is deducting the toll interest on their uh, ultimately their payment. If they now uh, uh, the system what we had earlier, treasury bill, treasury bonds were not liable to withhold in tax because if they'll if they'll deduct that withhold in tax, ultimately the, now uh, it is badly affecting to the treasury bill, treasury bond rates. Indirectly, it is affecting mm. the rate. Mm. The people who are investing consider mm. those uh, tax benefit tax um, on that also. Now, with that situation, I don't think they will introduce the withholding tax on treasury bills and treasury bonds. But what will happen? Um, uh, whatever it is, the treasury bill, treasury bond uh, interest income is liable to income tax. Now, if they deduct it is five percent, yes. you can say it off, but. Uh, but I don't think they will introduce that. Right. The way it is, the way it is uh, given in the bill, I don't think that it they are. It will be introduced, right. Uh, then Atula, as an individual, uh, there is currently, I'm going to say currently, I'm talking the current law, uh, up to 1.2 million, you can claim various expenses like health insurance, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Uh, All of them may be removed except solar panel. If you can explain that part of it, uh, how, how one can claim that. Solar panel thing. Yes, what we are saying, the, solar panel that six hundred thousand thing. That's right. That's right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so is that still remaining in the law? Or is that out of the law? Is that still remaining? No, no. It is remaining in the law. That so is the uh, relief. Right. That is you can explain how that works. You can explain how all that works. Yeah. Yeah. That is there. It continues. So some so a person can claim six hundred thousand maximum on investment on a solar panel at your house. Uh, in addition to the 1.2 million uh, tax free allowance, is that no, right? What, yeah, in addition to the 1.2 million uh, cap, uh, the personal allowance, they can claim this expenditure on solar panel, but this person that expenditure relief is abolished. It is abolished. Right. It's abolished. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Atula. Uh, I'll turn to Suleiman now. I'll come to Atula once again. Uh, okay. If we have time, so I'll come back to you. Uh, Suleiman, uh, you're online, you can hear me? Yes, can you? Uh, Suleiman, can you explain? Uh, there's a question from the audience. I'll, I'll rephrase a question the person asking. Uh, is that if you declare a dividend today and uh, you have paid, the recipient has paid the dividend tax, uh, but you make the payment after 1st October, if it rate of the law, if it comes from that day. Uh, then will the withholding tax be applicable on the payment or will it be the tax the person paid prior to the reception? How does it work? Uh, declaration takes place prior to that, but payment after it. So how, how does it work? Uh, so that's a redistribution, is it? <coughs> no, no, redistribution. Or a distribution of profits, yeah. That's right. So if it's a distribution of profits and it's uh, declared so until, until the... Um, Law is passed. The law is certified by the speaker. The withholding provision uh, will not kick in. Uh, so, if they do uh, issue a dividend, it will go without a withholding prior to the passing of the law. Uh, then, the recipient, how he will be taxed on that, is interesting uh, to see whether if it's an individual, whether it will be the normal slabs. Uh, but I think since it's a final withholding, uh, the only issue is the final withholding rate is not effective here because it comes into effect on the passing of the law. So there's a bit of a lacuna uh, there, but once it's considered to be a final withholding payment, uh, the 15% should be allowed on self-assessment basis, what I feel, uh, on the receipt of that in the absence of a withholding. Right. Uh, right, thank you. So one more question. If I ask you on the stock market listing, People were granted company that listed before a particular day were granted a concessionary rate of two years, I believe. 
Uh, now, with the amendment, will the relief go off or how, how does it work? It's going off. It was given for three years uh, from the time of listing. Uh, so that is to, the, this, this was the first year that they uh, sort of uh, used it. And from October 1st, uh, 2022, it's to go off. So they've only, they can only claim six months from the three years, unfortunately. Uh, but there is talk that that will be uh, changed, uh, given that a lot of companies spend a lot of money to actually get quoted. So that we are wait and see, but as the law stands, it ends uh, with uh, 30th September 2022. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Uh, I go back to uh, Mr. Professor Watavala. What is the time given uh, uh, for the Q&A? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, you can go up to five, no? Uh, oh, okay. You can... All right. Uh, so if I go back to... Uh, Professor, you also can take a question after this, right? I'll go to... I'll go to uh, Mr. Raja Paks and after that I can throw a question to you as well, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Raja Paks, you online, you can hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, my question to you is, uh, I mean, both Mahendra and you were talking about the, uh, in, I mean, the inconsistent tax policies. One government reduces, other government increases it. So there is a bit of, uh, you know, it has been happening for the last many years or so. Uh, but in the end, you know, now you're saying that, you know, the rates are going up, it's costly, everything. Uh, people are leaving Sri Lanka and going to other countries to work, etc. But against that argument, I mean, I put this argument to others. Uh, what they're saying is every country has taxes. For example, if you go to Australia, they pay 49% taxes. If you go to UK, you have to pay 30-35% uh, tax. Uh, India, 30% tax. So wherever you go, taxes will be paid. So why is it only in Sri Lanka that people are making issue about taxes? Uh, of Middle East, probably has a lesser tax regime, but most other countries have income tax. So, so why, what about the problem? So we have what, no, is your, we what is your reaction no. to an argument like that? No, no. We, we, have, do, we don't have any objection about the increasing of taxes. There's no issue on that. Even Mr. Jayashekar mentioned that we have no objection. But the, the issue is the consistency. Once you, the Inland Revenue Department has the confidence of the taxpayers. Now, you, now when the companies who were asked to uh, go public, were given a certain tax relief on, uh, so there's a okay. there should be confidence on that. So because of that confidence, they did the deal listing of the companies. After doing all that, after six months, you withdraw it. Then what did the taxpayers' confidence on the tax department? They won't believe anything but can taxpayers say. So I think uh, that is something that we are more worried. You know, as far as companies are concerned, we are not doing fly by night things. No, we have corporate plans, five year plan, cash flow plans. Therefore, we must know well in advance. What are our liabilities are going to be so that we can plan our income? Now, suddenly you increase the, the taxes and suddenly you change the policies, then that's going to be seen. Already we have faced this situation because the COVID which is unavoidable. But still for all, we managed to continue. But again, when these things are happening, now especially now, now the situation is, I don't think anybody will invest in industries because industries' investments are uh, ROIs for seven to eight years. Mm. Now we have faced a situation now, if to again the hydropower and this energy, or renewable energy projects are in shambles now because they have been not being paid for nine months. So now you are asked to pay those companies also to pay 30% taxes. So that is the money to pay. So they are, that even my, my view, is that there is no argument that in London department is imposing tax, no issue. So if they have a simplification and a consistency, that is the only issue that we, as company we need. Because our plan, our investment plans, our companies, we are not doing investment for just one year. We always, when we make an investment, we find the ROI. How much is going to be? Five years or six years. We, we, with that, we are planning. So now the situation is quite different. You know, we, we, we can plan an investment. So that is what we are worried about. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor. Hello, Professor Watala, can yeah. I turn to you for a question? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, Professor, if I look at the uh, questions, the chat box, uh, more than technical questions, they are all expressing frustration, anger about these increased taxes that they have to pay, etc. Uh, on the other hand, the government's uh, issue is that they have a debt that is not sustainable. And in order to, and that debt has been taken or borrowed to invest for the public in road, but I mean, corruption, wastage, all that is fine. But, that been invested for the benefit of the public at large. So I'm so we are paying the role of devil's advocate here, right? So uh, so that's benefit of the people itself we are investing this money, but 
we have borrowed and spent more than what we can afford to. So now we have come to a point where people, government can't borrow anymore, can't spend any of these things now. So they have to pay for the people. So do you think that kind of, now we are in a situation where the debt has to be sustainable. IMF is saying you have to get your debt sustainable. You need to achieve this kind of revenue levels. You need to have this kind of deficit. Your deficit must come down uh, from minus four to plus 2.3 on primary account. So there are those conditions that are put in the government and saying do this. Otherwise, there is no funding from us. Uh, there is no funding for Japan, India, or China, anyone. So in that situation, how do you, you have been holding high position in government uh, also? Uh, how does the government balance the situation, looking after the taxpayer who can't afford to pay tax, who's under tremendous pressure because of cost of living, uh, job losses, etc. On the hand, a government that does not have money, uh, whatever, even if I assume the expenditure is correct, that does not have money to run the government. So how do you balance these two forces? Actually, my experience is now, uh, if you want the private sector to invest, if you want the foreigners to come and invest in our country, they are looking at what is the uh, benefit that they are getting. So what they are saying is that they should get a good return in order that they can uh, uh, come and invest in a country. Because now uh, we want foreign exchange to come into this country. You know? So if foreign exchange is going to... Now our main thing is more than taxation, the foreign exchange. We need foreign exchange to pay the foreign loans. So uh, government has to look at this and see how we can attract maybe foreign investment. How we can uh, uh, increase our exports. Because if we, are, if we do not look at our foreign exchange side, definitely whatever we do is not going to help us. Because we are having a very heavy loans that have been taken. So these loans have been taken. But if we are going to, to repay the loans, uh, then we must uh, have uh, additional either our expenditure should be cut, cut down. So expenditure means now private sector expenditure, they will cut from their companies. But government, are they cutting the expenditure? Now also if you say, now where is this foreign exchange going? Now you see the foreign exchange is going uh, mainly say the uh, uh, it will be on the full no. So then, then we have to look at and see to have uh, to uh, work it out in a manner that this uh, uh, foreign exchange that is going out can be reduced. So how are they going to do it now? If they say that uh, the uh, uh, then they have to go to the renewable renewable energy. Renewable energy that, like uh, uh, Dr. Rajabaksa mentioned, uh, either maybe the fuel or now it is the sun. We have to now solar, then incentives uh, will have to be given or some sort of benefit. So I think the government needs to work out and show the people that this increase in taxation uh, is it going to pay the salaries of the public servants? Because now, even in accounting terms, we need to create value. You know? Is the government uh, government uh, servants, are they creating value to the nation? Or are they a burden? So this is one thing that we have to look at. So we have to see where the expenditure is. Then how we can increase our foreign uh, direct investment to come into this country. Because I see that the only way that we can repay these loans is through foreign direct investment and increase in exports. So if the foreign direct investment doesn't come into this country, then because uh, due to various other inefficiencies and other areas, then definitely we are going to be in serious trouble. Yeah, I know, understand. But how, how, how does, I understand what you're looking at as a more sustainable solution for the future, but how does the government meet the short-term requirements of, uh, of meeting lender obligations and uh, IMF obligations? Yeah, the, the, that uh, definitely the, there has to be massive uh, foreign investment that has to come in. Now, uh, if you look at now maybe any project, uh, the massive projects will have to come in. Now, you see, if you take the IT area, if they now educate our people, you have to train the people 
in technology, in IT industry, then automatically the foreign investment will come no because they want the cheap labor and then they can use our IT te uh, technologies uh, to export. That is how India developed. No? If you look at India, if you look at uh, Bangalore, if you look at Hyderabad, if you look at uh, maybe the other areas that have developed, it is due to the knowledge. So government has to do this. Actually, today our knowledge area is very weak. We don't have sufficient people. Now, even if we, uh, the people who are there are now live in the country. So I think the education has to be done by the private sector. When I say private sector, it is public-private partnership because it will be the government university, but the education, uh, like in the schools, education will be done by so many private colleges. Then everyone uh, will be able to get a good IT uh, degree. They will be able to get an engineering degree without any difficulty because now everyone is going overseas to, to get this, even medical degrees. Why are we spending so much of money? The, our people, our money is all going out for education. So if we are able to educate our people, I think a lot of these problems will be sorted out. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, I, I there aren't very many. Sorry, someone has to say something. Yeah, can I add in there, Dominda? Yes, please, Suresh, yes. Yeah, see now, as Professor rightly pointed out also, the point here is basically we have to analyze the situation that we are in. And what is happening now is we are basically looking at the IMF conditions and we are looking at the short run. In order to increase the revenue, we are looking solely as at the taxation and collect the taxation, yeah, collect taxes in a uniform manner without analyzing the repercussions. Now, now rightly as rightly Professor pointed out again, now, the policy should not be just to collect the increase the revenue. We have there has to be a strategy. Are we looking at particular industries and then use tax as a tool to support those industries? So when those industries grow, uh, there will be uh, maybe foreign currency the revenue coming. So that's we need to use tax as a tool to support the industries. It's not just blindly forget the industries and then use tax as a measure to uh, collect the revenue to the government that that is what is happening that is what should not happen now once upon a time also when the government industry when the sri lanka was uh, suffering in 89 uh, 88 is like late 80s now what did he do tax was used as a tool to give all the support to the apparel industry and apparel industry became a successful store in sri lanka likewise at this juncture also what we should be doing is select the growth areas and then use tax as a tool to support those growth areas when those growth areas uh, bring uh, revenue that is where the economy will like again which is not happening so we are we are not planning we are just looking yeah. at the short run and simply basically increasing the taxes and that will result in killing some of our most important uh, industries also sure sure no, i agree with what you're saying but the counter theory is that taxation should not be used as a tool for investment to improve our doing business indexes is what they are saying. Doing business index should be improved. Approval should be given faster. Land approval should be given. Land should be available. And uh, improve the doing business okay. index and not to use tax as a tool is another argument that people. But I agree with you, but we always had concession rates for uh, certain industry. I mean, so there are two sides of the argument. So, no, uh, Duvinda, can I say the doing, index, doing business index, doing business index is really uh, for the infrastructure, now you see people are putting up houses and all these things, you know. But there are, there are a lot of problems that are there. But if for industries, there should be no obstruction. If for industries come for export, Absolutely. industries for local, immediately permission should be given and let them start. Then That's this right. business index will not be a yes. problem. Actually, that is how the 200 government factory program was carried out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in 20 years ago, it was absolute success. No, no, I carried it out. No, I am the one during my time. I know. It. You know, World Bank said don't give tax incentive, but the president at that time said, okay, we will go ahead. But now you see, uh, the two hundred million dollars we earned at that time now is five billion. So Absolutely. You can Absolutely. See, we have to Absolutely. go in uh, that direction. Correct. That's right. So someone has to take the decision and move forward. You know. 
Yeah. Can I add? Can I add? Yes, that? please. Yes, please. Yeah. Now, as uh, Mr. Suresh Pera mentioned, there was a time government has identified trust industries. So those exactly. trust, they selected certain industries, trust industries, and they give all the possible incentives. Right? We must always understand that you know this taxation doesn't support uh, dollar earnings. There's no, there's no way Correct. Correct. the dollars. The main main issue here is shortage of dollars. So what taxes yes. the tax department had done to increase dollars? They are now, they are trying to build the goose. They should increase. The, they should support the companies who are earning dollars yeah. and also the dollar earners and dollar savers are there. They have not done this. You know, yeah. we are on the equal board as those who are importing and selling. And that Absolutely. is definitely that is not correct. So we should yeah. have dollar earners and dollar savers. Those are the industries that we should support. And also, as as Mr. Suresh Pera mentioned, now there is no way how to save how to save dollars. Now, for example. Now, right now, the our biggest cost is fuel. Now, what action we have done, done to save the fuel? Have we supported the uh, renewable energy? Have we supported the electronic car, electric cars? We have not done anything. We are consuming huge amount of fuel. We have to reduce the consumption of fuel. QR code has done something, but there are a lot of, lot of things can be done. Now, with the BMS encourage all the houses to have solar, solar panels. That will definitely save a lot of things. There are so many areas that we can include. Even if you go to the harbor, all the warehouses, we can install solar panels. That will generate huge amount of electricity. That part is not linked to. So we have to see that the, to the budget, how to do that. You know, if we have the incentives to the to solar panels, everybody will walk into that area. That will save huge amount of dollars. That part has not been looked into the tax. They are already collecting on the rupee taxes only. That is the mistake that they have done in this tax. Correct, correct. Thank you. Even the, even the fourteen percent tax we are getting, we may not get. Is what you are saying? Not only the tax, even the some money <laughs> we are not getting. That's right. Correct. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and the, so, the, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Suresh. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah so, so basically, again, something. when you look at the policies again, so if you are saying that we are going on the basis, uh, we are going to we are going to disregard the concept of uh, repricing using tax as a tool for growth. What is the logic, basically, uh, excepting the share market? Now we are basically imposing taxes on uh, all the, you know, dollar earning companies, etc., and uh, saying that uh, uniformity is uh, what is what matters at this uh, in the, the short uh, term to uh, repay the loans, etc. But then, what is the reason for excluding the share market, buying and selling shares? Is that going to uh, is that going to add to our GDP? So oh, you're right. Not, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Professor, I, I just the last question I'll post session uh, because uh, the questions that are coming in the chat box are largely answered in the presentation itself. I mean, exemption and IT, I think all that has been covered. There are a lot of questions IT exemption, service exemption. I think Suleiman's presentation covered most of it. And uh, Suleiman, you are sharing the slide with the CMA who uh, can send to the participants so that uh, those questions that are asked on technical things can be covered. Uh, so, Atula, you have to share the slide with the with CMA so that they can send to the participants. So, whatever questions that come uh, uh, can 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 be covered. Uh, just, just one last question to Siva. Siva, are you there online, Siva? Yes. Uh, Siva, now on this, uh, uh, when taxes impose mid year, say September first of October. Uh, how complicated it would be for companies to calculate their taxes? Is it based on actual figures or is it based on apportionment or will that be contested by the department? For example, uh, on, by any chance, if the second six months becomes a loss and the first six months become a profit, will there be a contest there? And how, how can someone, uh, how can someone uh, face a situation like that? Yeah, actually, the, it's a complicated, I think similar the provision we had in 2019-20 also. So uh, what I would say is basically the, the law identified the first six months and the, the second six months. But I personally believe based on the profitability of the company, you can segregate without apportionment. But only the practically, as you know, that it will be difficult to justify to the department. You must give a so uh, six months account separately to justify that one. But that may not be the original financial statements. So is there a necessity to audit those six months or is it not audited? It I don't think it's not practical. There's no requirement also in that line. 
So right. I think we have to support with the real profitability for a separate period. Yeah. So there can be this issue by any chance, because six months become a loss. That's there right. can be a contest. They might say, okay, you have put the profit. Genuinely, genuine, uh, genuinely, if there's a second six months you are losses, uh, you must be able to uh, claim the losses. Yeah. So you must go on a syndicate basis. Right. And one more thing, yes, please, please go ahead. Uh, they are, I think they are going to impose the withholding tax or advance for advance income tax on a mandatory basis. So that we had this uh, bad experience previously also, of course, you must collect the tax. Uh, the question here is, you have to introduce a proper direction system also in case of loss situation. Because I have a bad experience, one of the company, the BUI companies, actually not, uh, we are that, the turnover was taxed at two percent under BUA agreement, but that time the rent, the rent payment is and rent was withholding. The department's position is there's no uh, provision to give a direction. Well, you know, for sure, definitely they are, they are liability going to be less than 10 percent because the balance eight percent going to be a refund. Hmm. But uh, finally, the company has to suffer the withholding and uh, ask for the refund. Yes, years. I know. So, refunds don't come as so well. If you are going to introduce a Withholding system, parallel you must introduce a direction system or the effective direction system. Thank you, Siva. So, Professor, we have had a very interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Duminda, uh, there is a. Uh, Duminda, there is a little more time. Actually, we said five o'clock, but I just want to okay. ask you ask a question from you, Duminda. Ah, for me, right, okay. uh, now you are really uh, second in command and will be taking over the presidency of the Ceylon Chamber. Uh, can you tell us now, actually, because now this is uh, you are the largest uh, chamber and the, all the largest companies are there in the chamber. What is the sort of action uh, you all are doing in order that uh, to see how our country can overcome this uh, current uh, uh, big uh, problem that we are having on this uh, repayment of loans. And do you think that uh, this sort of tax thing should be the way or should we work out another way, uh, another strategy, how we can pull out the country out of this total mess? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're going to be a spot, right? So let me say, uh, I think the Ceylon Chambers, uh, not my person, I mean, my person as a Ceylon Chambers uh, position and what we've done so far. Uh, professor, is that uh, we are looked at it from different angles. Uh, first, uh, our strategy at the beginning of this year, middle of this year, was to see how we can bring some level of political stability into the country in order to uh, continue with what the IMF and all are doing. Uh, so, with regard to that, we have had extended discussions with all political parties, uh, at least 30, 40 meetings we had, in trying to explain the situation to the country situation, the economic situation, and the downfall that can happen if there's political instability. So, that part we think we have been, I don't know this only because of us, but I think we have been achieved some degree of stability because of that reason. We spoke to all the political parties and told them not to strike, not to procure other roads. We need to get our tourism back on track. If there are, you know, if there is protest, the tourists won't come. Uh, so we are going to be loose from this. So that part, I think we have done and we are on engagement we do on a weekly basis. On the economic side, Professor, uh, the Ceylon Chamber's position is country first is position we always take. And uh, we don't take individual industries into account. And our position has been that we uh, we have no choice but to make the debt sustainable. We have engaged with the Indian High Commission. We have spoken to Japanese. We have spoken to Chinese. We have spoken to all uh, all the bilateral countries that lend us money. We have spoken to all their projects have come to a standstill, and they have very clearly told us that until and at such time the IMF agreement is signed that they are unable to give us any more money to finance any other projects. So because of that, if you can see, all the construction, large projects like the roads, the bridges, the airports have come to a standstill. So we have to therefore uh, get the IMF agreement through. And to get the IMF agreement through, the creditors have to agree on the uh, debt pressurely, whether it's a haircut, whether it's a deferment, we don't know. But some way or other, the creditors must agree with us. The bilateral and the multilateral creditors must agree, plus the individual creditors must agree at least a framework with which they agree within to negotiate a ratio of the debt to make it sustainable. And we are working towards that. We are engaging the IMF, we are engaging the World Bank. And in that context, the taxation issue uh, comes in. That is why, uh, so the IMF condition is that 
Sri Lanka must achieve 2.5% surplus of the primary account, that is salaries and interest payment together should, the income should be 2.5% above the total salaries and interest payments by 2025. So if we can't achieve that with 2.5%, IMF will withdraw from the agreement uh, if the milestone is not achieved, because they are coming on a four-year program. So in the first year, second year, we can't achieve that, they'll withdraw from the So if they withdraw, others will also withdraw. So we have to have agreement creators and show the IMF how we are going to achieve the 2.5% surplus. And in that context, only the government has brought the tax change, the revenue changes. So in order to get to 2.5 of the primary account, they'll have to increase taxes. I know the government expenditure is high, it's not transparent, all the time we are aware. So only the government expenditure can't be reduced overnight. Uh, it needs restructuring. You have you can't say public servants home overnight because 70% of government expenditure is in salaries, 80% is salaries, only 20% is on capital. So we can't put the governments on the road overnight. The health, education, military, police, all that. We can't put them on the road. So we need to have a restructuring program that goes on uh, over a two-year period. At the same time, we are insisting that the SOEs are reformed. So now the uh, president and the government has formed the SO reform strategy committee. Uh, Mr. Suresh Shah is the chairman of that, of Chartered Accountant. And uh, the restructuring has to happen as fast as possible. We are pushing for it. So all the SOEs are reformed. The CEB, the CPC, Sri Lankan Airlines, Railways and CTB are the primary ones. Have to be reformed so that government expenditure, leading of these industries can be reduced. And once that is achieved, if that is achieved in two years, then taxes can be brought down. So if the surplus takes place, if we can sell some of these uh, institutions, if you can restart some of these institutions, then we can bring the cost down and the benefit can be passed to people in terms of lower taxes. So that is the strategy the government is following for which we are supporting and which we are trying to, we are engaging them on a constantly, on a weekly basis to make that happen. So that's the position that the is taking. Yeah, one, one question I have, uh, Duminda, is now you see the, most of the de government departments are only uh, uh, spending money, you know. Can't we get them to earn some money? Like yes, what so the, the private sector is doing. Yes, yeah, so, so, so now, for example, the CEB and the CPC are now working on price-based, uh, uh, market-based pricing. The CEB uh, tariff form has taken place. A further tariff will take place in December. Uh, the water board has already uh, increased their prices. The CPC, uh, has gone for market-based pricing to an extent. So railway and CTP have not gone there yet. So uh, cost plus pricing has been introduced in the three biggest sectors to see how the uh, burden of the government can be reduced. Uh, but regard other departments, like for example, the postal department, which is also an issue. So postal also can become market-based, but their use is less now because people don't write letters now. So those are things that they have to close down or reduce in size. Right, but the unions are very active, very difficult to do that, right? You know, the unions get out of the roads, they'll protest, they'll strike, the political parties will join for their own advantage. So it's very difficult to introduce reform without the support of the unions and political parties. So all have to come to one platform. A national policy must be there to do these things without one political party can't do. No, my my situation is that it is not only increase in prices, no. There is so much of, uh, say, no productivity, inefficiency, uh, waste. Now, they must, uh, because you see, otherwise, the yeah. society or the people are incurring all these Absolutely. expenses. Absolutely. So that's why, that's, I think, should be a must. Absolutely. So, so, so we are insisting on those matters also. Professor Batolitik, as you know, governments are so react on those matters. Political parties will fight so long as the opposition will come to government there again to protect those institutions for their own advantage. So it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult process for me in the private sector to uh, understand and implement. You know, I agree with what you're saying, 100%. So we can get a final view of all our panelists and then... Huh? Yeah, up, no? so we can start with uh, Suleiman, you can start with yourself. <laughs> yes, so, uh, in terms of final views, uh, there are a lot spoken about... Uh, mostly the negatives, I think, rather than any positives from this change. I suppose the positive is the overall benefit that uh, we look at in terms of economic recovery, hopefully. Um, but uh, I think the changes uh, have to be looked at by all the stakeholders who are affected by it, various types of income, various industries, 
uh, various chambers and the overall impact to the economy should also be assessed. It's not just income. Uh, yes, income is going up, but at what cost? Is that cost uh, more significant than the income that you're going to uh, raise? And is it going to be sustainable? Is it going to have a collapse after you collect the income for two years? After that, is there's a collapse? Is there a point in collecting it? Can we prolong it in some way? Uh, so those that, that discussion should be uh, entertained by the Ministry of Finance from various stakeholders to ensure that the whole economy uh, is uh, positively uh, affected, uh, not only in the short term, but in the medium to long term as well. Atula. Yeah. Now, uh, as much as possible, the questions uh, which were there in the uh, uh, chat box or uh, question and answers, I managed to answer those things in on the screen itself, mm. uh, whatever the leftover things later on, we'll be able to uh, answer those things later on. Right? Uh, now, my idea now, <coughs> when you see these tax changes this year, as we, as we discuss, the priority sectors, we have not given a special rate, special rates for priority sectors. As an example, the export, the foreign currency income earning, we have not given any priority, priority income tax rate for them. As a result, at the end, the result may be the government will lose a lot of um, foreign currency which are coming into the countries. Our people will either shift our companies to overseas or the businesses which are doing on um, uh, online system, they will, they will incorporate companies, they will set up companies in abroad and do these businesses through those entities, but physically the services may be rendered in Sri Lanka, but uh, for all recording purposes, they will, they will record these things in overseas books of accounts and um, bring that money into Sri Lanka. Then ultimately that is a business carried out in abroad. And as a result, if they'll show like that, then uh, government will lose a lot of tax money with that. And also, the foreign currency. And the other thing, as we learn, the tax is not an income source to the government, but also it is a measure of structuring the development of the country. Therefore, these different sectors should have different tax rates, uh, like export. We have to give a lower tax rate. Uh, I think that's all what I have to say. I thank you. Uh, Siva, you want to say anything to conclude? Yes. Uh, actually, now if you look at my overall comment here, the one of the, uh, the main issues is one of the economic growth. I think it's a lacking. Another one is uh, unemployment because of the foreign currency issues. So assuming, suppose if you implemented these tax states, then the government should must have a strategy to have this increased revenue to cater to the economic growth. But otherwise, what will happen is with the private sector, <clears throat> by, when you're contributing this tax by the private sector to the government sector, definitely the private sector will have a problem of reinvestment. So there will be impact to the economic growth on the private sector by interview. Unless the government effectively use this money, I think the growth will further come down. Yeah, that is very dangerous for this particular situation. Because some of the one of the concepts, some people have a school of thought. When you are imposing more and more taxes, unless the government properly use, utilize this particular additional revenue, so there will, this, there will be further reduction of the economic growth. Of course, we have other essential items also, I agree with that. The secondly, the foreign currency issues, that is our major issues. I think we are discussing that one also. So there is no solution given at this stage, even to our main crisis. So what is happening now is, because of this particular tax rates going up specific export sector, so a lot of exporters, especially the government factories, they may move to some other countries. So then we will have a, uh, some more problem in the foreign currency issues that may be accelerated also. And mainly that the SME sector, I think we must always uh, develop the SME sector for economic growth. But here what is happening is when we increase the tax rates, and don't even the your VAT rate has gone up, the slab has come down, SSCL has increased. When you say effective tax rate has gone up drastically. 
for SME sectors, old businesses, and the, even for the individuals also. So therefore, so in conclusion, I think this increased revenue should be utilized properly to effectively use for economic growth and the essential sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Suresh, anything you want to say? Yeah, I mean, I will take this opportunity to build on uh, the issue that you raised at the beginning of the session. Uh, this is with regard to that slashing of the 30 day period to 14 yes. days, uh, with regard to uh, uh, making requests for admin reviews. Now, an uh, issue that will come up in relation to this change is what is the <coughs> year from this is going to be applicable? Now, hmm. 30th, uh, 30th November, we have to file the return. And uh, the next uh, set of uh, admin reviews uh, or other assessments will come for year of assessment 1920, 18, 19, uh, season is over, so 1920, 2021, uh, so on and so forth. So now, is this amendment going to be effective prospectively or retrospectively or from which year is an issue because this became an issue uh, in relation to year of assessment 18-19 as well as in relation to year of assessment 2013-14 also and we do have a decided uh, court case also in relation to this. so to avoid uh, this 14 days is a bad basically I request the government not to do the not to reduce it to 14 days but if they are going ahead uh, I think it's better that clarity should be provided uh, in the amendment itself uh, as to the year in which this will be applicable from, rather than keeping it blank and then uh, uh, leaving room for stakeholders to uh, come up with interpretations and, you know, litigation. So avoid unnecessary litigation. Go ahead and basically tell the, clarify the year from which this will be applicable. Thank you, Suresh. Now, Rajapak says that you want to say. I, I, I agree with Mr. Sivanesan, who mentioned that there will be no reinvestment there will be more tax evasion that's going to take place and black market will increase because of this. So to higher the taxes, the evasion will be more. But more than that, I want to mention that, that this, uh, this, uh, tax, this tax budget has not addressed the foreign exchange part of it. There's no increase in foreign exchange or at least they are decreasing. So what I said, my make, I want to make a proposal. That the biggest cost is fuel cost. At least make all the government buildings, hospitals and schools, large schools, all the roof to be converted to solar. To solar. So that give incentives to do those things, at least that will save a huge amount of foreign exchange because dollar earning is and dollar saving, both are equally important. Absolutely. Now, since we are we can't attract foreign direct investment now, as Mr. Professor Vatavali mentioned, I don't think we can we can attract foreign direct investment with the present taxation is impossible. So then in that case, then we are going to the dollar savings. So the saving is the number one is the fuel. So fuel saving, the only thing that we can do is the investment on solar panels, and we do have huge buildings. If you take the warehouses in port, and if you take the hospitals, <coughs> if you take the schools, if you fix all the solar panels on those areas, I think substantial amount of uh, foreign exchange can be saved on those things. I think that is the proposal that I want to make to the government. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So, Professor, over to you. Uh, so, I will uh, bring Sen to the uh, an end right. to the panel discussion. Uh, almost, I think, uh, one hour or so, yes. So, Do you have uh, any final comments, in that? No, no, I have been. So I, I think it's, it's a world that we live in. So uh, I understand the grievances people are experiencing. I mean, all our taxes are going up, right? Including our, our personal taxes are going up hugely. So it's, uh, I only hope that is used for a useful purpose. That is all. Yeah. So, uh, so with that, I want to hand it over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Duminda. I think it was a very uh, uh, detailed and elaborate discussion with uh, so many points coming in. And of course, taxation handle area was uh, handled initially uh, from the beginning uh, from uh, by Mr. Atul Ranavira and also Mr. Sulaiman Nista, who told us about the various changes that are going to take place. And thereafter, where you handle the uh, uh, the panel discussion extremely well. And uh, I'm sorry that I asked the question about the chamber, but I'm sure uh, that... No, that is public knowledge. Uh, is okay. uh, that is, so everyone uh, was... Uh, I think uh, uh, quite quite happy as to what uh, you all are doing. But I think the mo most important thing, of course, the taxation that bringing in a lot of maybe difficulties to the people or the, it is really not to the people, but it's to the uh, uh, businessmen and others. But I'm sure that, uh, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, we have to maybe in this difficult situation, 
uh, try to try to over the difficult pro area but uh, still people are not sure as to how this is going to work i think uh, in uncertain conditions and situations this uh, uh, normally happens but i'm sure that uh, uh, before long that we will be able to work out uh, uh, some uh, solutions but this also needs some adjustments you know now as uh, mentioned now price increases are okay but then we need to look at the other areas also you know uh, the productivity the efficiency maybe eight hours of work or 16 hours or 24 hours of work so i think uh, we need to put in all these things if we are uh, really uh, going to succeed so let me thank uh, all our panelists, I think they've uh, gone into deep depth in all these things, uh, both from the uh, tax consultant's point of view and also from the industrialist point of view, which was extremely good. And of course, I must thank Mr. Gajendra also for uh, chairman of our tax committee for helping out and handling uh, the, uh, the session very well. So uh, also all our participants, I think we had... Uh, uh, more than 400 participants. So this shows, I think, always uh, tax is a very popular uh, maybe topic in everyone because that uh, affects the individual plus also the businesses and companies and a lot of them are interested to see that could be done. Uh, so let me thank everyone, but let me also uh, remind everyone that uh, we are uh, uh, going for our annual conference. So... Uh, maybe that's uh, not an online one, but it's a physical one. So we will be able to send you the details in order that you all can support us and register with us. And also the uh, our CME Excellence in Integrated Reporting Awards, where many of the public quoted companies are involved and they are able to actually... The, integrated reporting is value creation so i'm happy that uh, doing the that uh, i will uh, be inviting you that you'll be there for that because you can see how the major companies and the, those who are winning the sme sector is also there how they have performed and done extremely well in this uh, value creation exercise and of course today is uh, environmental social and governance so that the society is also looked after which i'm sure all of you all uh, would like to come for that and um, see the performance of these companies and uh, i think uh, let me once again thank everyone uh, for their time that they have spared because i must say that because of your contribution that we have been able to give this free of charge because you all have contributed your valuable time and also the the, the need for the people to learn about this because we are playing a major role. Actually, uh, people think that the government has to do it, but the private sector has done it. So similarly, I think we have to do many more things uh, which uh, the government has to do if the government is, uh, if the economy is going to succeed. And I think the public-private partnership is something uh, that we need to immediately get into. And uh, I support what... Uh, Dumin has mentioned the various areas and discussions that they have had. And I'm sure that uh, whatever way that we could support, uh, definitely our support will be there in order to uh, uh, to come out of this situation, which is uh, really required by everyone. So once again, let me uh, thank uh, all of you because you have been contributing throughout in all our tax webinars, which has been very useful to everyone, uh, both from the tax consultants, from the... Uh, tax firms and also from our industry side. So let me once again thank all of you all and of course our uh, chairman of our tax committee, Mr. Gajendra, for all the support that they have given and wish you all the very best and also all our, our secretariat that have been uh, handling all these areas and doing uh, working very hard to make this a great success. So thank you and all the very best uh, to all of you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you look after yourself and uh, hope that uh, this will bring uh, prosperity to Sri Lanka. Thank you and bye. Thank you.